All right, well, thanks for joining us for Escape the Data Dungeon, uh, Unlock Scalable R Analytics and Machine Learning. And also thanks to the R Consortium for hosting uh, this R database webinar. Uh, let's first introduce ourselves. I'm Mark Hornick with Oracle Machine Learning Product Management. I've been involved with the R Consortium since its founding and with R more generally for around 15 years. Um, I focused on in-database machine learning since Oracle's acquisition of the company Thinking Machines in 1999, and more recently, also on Oracle Autonomous Database AI features. Sherry? I'm Sherry Luanica, a consulting member of technical staff in the Oracle Machine Learning product team. I work with internal and external customers in leveraging Oracle Machine Learning technologies. I've been working with R for 20 years and with Oracle Machine Learning for R since its beginning. All right. so. Oracle is a supporter of the R community for, for over a decade now, and the R consortium <laughs> since its founding. You know, to help our users work more seamlessly with their database data, uh, we introduced Oracle Machine Learning for R in 2011. Then it was called Oracle R Enterprise. And with OML for R 2.0, Oracle continues to enhance the ability of R users to take advantage of powerful database capabilities, both with Oracle Database and Autonomous Database. And we also maintain the R Oracle database connectivity package and provide a redistribution of R for use with Oracle database. Now today, we're going to start with a characterization of the data dungeon, you know, a rather amusing analogy, but one that sometimes feels quite appropriate. You know, we'll touch on the benefits of databases as a focal point for data access, uh, organization and analysis, as well as autonomous database, which you know, eliminates so much of the overhead and complexity with using traditional database management systems. We'll then dive into a few use cases and demonstrations involving demand forecasting, customer churn, and product bundling before wrapping up. So, on to the data dungeon. Now, you have lots of amazing data, right? But it uh, may be all over the place. Some of it's in spreadsheets, uh, CSV files, departmental databases, cloud storage repositories, and even individual laptops. Uh, it's a challenge when there are so many data silos. You know, it may feel as though your data is trapped in some sort of dungeon, you know, requiring a lot of effort to figure out what you have and where you have it. If the data is large, moving that data from one place to another can become expensive, both in terms of time and money, feeling like your data is somehow locked up. You know, duplicating database data in local environments can also pose increased security risks. There are production deployment challenges for reliable data access, the need to integrate R engines with production applications and handling of more complex error situations, as well as overall production level scalability. Now, this is where databases and their data catalogs come in. They enable you to organize your data where it's easy to find, use, and make sense of, whether it's physically stored in the database or through external tables that reference data stored elsewhere. Combined with Oracle Machine Learning for R, you can more easily work with your database data with minimal data movement and easier solution deployment as we're going to see. And Autonomous Database offers those same benefits and more. So let's take a look at what that's all about. You know, while you're likely familiar with the Oracle database, you may be wondering what's an autonomous database? Well, we're using the cloud to uh, eliminate the complexity of data management while also providing a suite of integrated analytics tools, including support for R, all in the same platform. Now, traditionally, each database deployment was more or less unique, where you needed to build, secure, repair, patch, and tune each database. And this was labor intensive and generally not scalable. Now, Autonomous Database reimagines Oracle Database for the cloud with automation of infrastructure, as well as database and data center operations. And it takes care of database administration, so you don't have to spend time and resources tuning your database, applying patches, or updating software, among other you know, database administrator tasks. So Autonomous Database helps you escape the data dungeon by allowing you to reach a wide range of data sources, data in multiple formats, generative AI, and other supporting tools. Now, of course, SQL is the predominant language used for accessing uh, databases and manipulating data, but not everyone is a SQL expert. And using a native language interface like R makes working with database data that much more convenient. 
When you need data, you may end up importing data snapshots from Excel or CSV files. Some R users may have direct programmatic access to pull data from the database to the R client and push results back to the database. But this round trip can result in scalability issues such as access latency and local memory limitations. Also, by definition, you know, data snapshots are obsolete and often require refreshing. Data may have errors that require going back to the source for correction to re-retrieve that data. And these round trips, of course, take additional time. In addition, data privacy laws can require keeping data in secure systems or locations. So to help address these issues, our focus is on enabling in-database processing from R. And we're gonna highlight the use of OML for R from a few interfaces and how they can connect to Oracle Database and Autonomous Database. You know, for R, we have the popular R Studio IDE and OML Notebooks, which is built into Autonomous Database and supports R Paragraphs. We can also use SQL Developer to invoke R from SQL. One of the deployment scenarios that we'll cover involves using REST endpoints for deployed models and invoking user-defined R functions in database-spawned R engines. And we'll demonstrate that using Postman. Now, I suspect you're familiar with the typical machine learning workflow. You know, we're gonna highlight aspects of each step, but on the deployment front, we'll highlight working with in-database models as well as uh, native R models, illustrating these from R, SQL, and REST. Now, the three scenarios we'll cover are demand forecasting using in-database time series exponential smoothing, a customer churn using in-database classification algorithms and a native R algorithm, R part, and product bundling and recommendation using the in-database a priori association rules algorithm. Now, our first scenario involves aggregated call center interaction counts with the goal of forecasting the volume of call center interactions or customer incidents. These incidents are categorized by the type of request like billing, coverage, or policy question, and the channel where they were received like chatbot, email, or phone. Now, rather than build a single forecast model for all of this data, we wanna do this at a finer granularity. So we're going to use partitioned models to automate the building of a model on each partition of data, specified by one or more columns, like category and channel. But these are used and managed as a single top-level model. Now, you can use partitioned models for classification, regression, clustering, and other machine learning techniques, as well as time series. In the demo notebook that we'll look at, we'll also highlight the use of Conda environments and that allows us to work with additional packages such as ggplot2 to customize the packages we want to work with. Now, the second scenario involves customer churn, where we'll build in-database models to predict likely churners. We'll see prediction details to understand why an individual prediction was made and deploy an in-database model to OML services for access from REST endpoints. The second part of the churn example includes building a native R part model where we'll invoke it using what we call embedded R execution from R, SQL, and REST. And the last example involves product bundling and recommendation. We have sales data on customer purchases. And this will allow us to identify frequent item sets that can be used for candidate product bundles, product placement for online shopping or store layout, as well as inventory management for co-occurring purchases. Then we'll use the association rules to rank products to recommend based on their support, confidence, and lift. So let's move on to the demonstrations. Okay, so we're looking at the Oracle Machine Learning uh, user interface on Autonomous Database. And I'm just going to go into our notebooks listing. And we're going to start, I'm going to log in. It logged me out automatically. And so we're going to go into the uh, notebooks listing. For demand forecasting. So this is our first notebook we're going to work with. Now I'm just going to run all of the paragraphs from the top. 
Um, and that's going to start up the environment and uh, continue to uh, support all of the different paragraphs that we have here. To start off with, though, for the initialization, we're going to look at the Conda environment that we created that has a wide range of our packages, and in particular, the packages that we've added specifically that we wanted to use, in this case, ggplot2. We see that here. We're then going to download uh, this environment and activate it so we can use it in the notebook environment. And this allows those additional packages to be made available. We're then going to initialize ORE and the ORE dplyr packages by uh, loading those. And then, we're going to start off with accessing our data table. Now, the table we're working with is called call data2. And using the ORE sync function, this gives us a database table proxy object that corresponds to an R data frame. But the data remains in the database. And we see that its class is ORE frame, which is a subclass of the R data frame class, and other proxy objects that we have available to us in the environment. Now, to give you a sense of how does a proxy object differ from uh, a data frame, here we're looking at the structure of that. And one of the key things that we want to highlight is the data query. This corresponds to the uh, query that one would use to access that table in the database. From the description, we see the columns and their uh, types, as well as the table called data2 that this corresponds to. Now, next, we can view some of the records from uh, call data2. Again, using the proxy object and the overloaded head function, we're retrieving some of those values and displaying them here in the table uh, view of the notebook uh, itself. Mark, what does z.show do? Yeah, so z.show is a function that's provided to allow us to take the results that we get from the R environment and map those into the, the notebook environment for displaying in this interface. Now, we also have other overloaded functions like distinct in this case for saying, well, what are the distinct categories and channels that we have? And next, we're going to uh, focus on ggplot2. So we'll load uh, that library and we're going to pull the call data to data from the database into our memory and do a transformation on uh, the date received column. Why do we need to pull the data to the client? Yeah, that's a great question. When we're using third-party R packages, what we need to do is make the data available in R memory to use them. You know, we don't change the underlying implementation of packages to work with database data. So if you're using a native package, that data has to be brought into R memory. And that's where ORE pull allows us to very conveniently take that data from the database and bring it into an R data frame. Of course, you do have to be careful of volume of data that you're pulling because memory limitations certainly do apply. Okay, now using ggplot2, uh, we're just going to uh, do a few simple visualizations here just to illustrate that one can do that. And it will do a plot of the data using, uh, in this case, highlighting the number of calls received over time by the category and channel. Moving further to filter data, we're going to use the dplyr functionality again. We have incident category is what we're going to get back and using this proxy object for call data too. We're gonna to filter group by summarize that data. Essentially we wanna aggregate the counts for each category and associate those with the date. So when we build our uh, time series model, the exponential smoothing model will have the data that we need. We're also going to do incidents all that does something similar, but it also includes the category and channel. And recall that we talked about the partitioned models. So when we build a partition model here, we'll have three partitions, one for each category. And in the case of the incidents all, we'll have nine because there are three categories and three channels. We can also get a bar plot of incidents uh, by day of week. So again, we're using dplyr on the incidents all and using uh, mutate, we're going to uh, transform the uh, date received uh, by day and uh, get the resulting plot here. Where is the computation occurring for the ORE dplyr functionality? That's part of the transparency layer that we have with OML for R. And so what that means is that these functions that are overloaded, they're actually translating those requests into corresponding SQL that is then executed in the database. So because we have, you know, incidents all here is a data frame proxy object, 
that is going to take the corresponding SQL for the mutate, the group by and the like, and run that in the database and provide back to us another uh, proxy object. Because we don't want to pull data to the client unless we absolutely have to, to do certain analyses. Okay, so that brings us to modeling. And in this case, we want to build an in-database exponential smoothing model uh, using Holt Winters. And we're going to have a partitioned model here where we're going to build one sub-model per category. Now, how do we do that? Well, first we're going to delete any model that we have created uh, previously. And we have a number of settings that we can specify. Most notably, what's the prediction step? How many uh, forecast periods do we want to have? And we're going to have four for that. Uh, the model is going to be Holt Winters. We have seasonality of 26. And this is where we're identifying the column that we want to partition the data on to form one submodel uh, per category. And we're going to identify the model name here explicitly uh, as uh, ESM Incident Forecast 1. Now, to invoke this model, we're using OERI ODM ESM. We specify the formula. Uh, the data, which is a proxy object again, because this model build is going to occur in the database. So we just need a reference to the data that's there. And of course, the corresponding settings. Mark, what is the ODM in the model build um, function name? And why are we getting a warning about the model build? Yeah, so the ODM uh, is corresponding to the original uh, name of the in-database machine learning, which was called Oracle Data Mining. And so we incorporated that into the names uh, to highlight the fact that this is an in-database algorithm that's being used. And in terms of the warning message, we see that it's saying, you know, ORE does not manage this uh, mining model's lifecycle. Well, that's because when we uh, designed OML for R, we wanted it to mimic the behavior of uh, a native R experience. So when you build models or you create data frames in uh, R, those objects, when R, uh, when you uh, terminate the R uh, process, it they disappear. There's nothing there unless you've explicitly saved them. And so we modeled that same behavior by saying, if we don't specify a name for the uh, model that uses a default name, that when you exit out of the uh, R process, it's simply going to delete those uh, in database models for you automatically. If you provide a name, then you assume the responsibility for uh, explicitly deleting that model uh, later. All right, so having built that model, we can look at the partitions uh, from this, and we see that we have the three submodels for billing issue, coverage question, and, and policy cancellation. And we could even build uh, the second partition model, both on category and channel. And the only thing that we need to change is the partition column name, in this case, category and channel. Again, we uh, run that and we'll see that we have new partitions, uh, nine in all, that have the corresponding category and channel. For those of uh, you who have teams that are not just for our users, but also include SQL users, perhaps part of the uh, IT organization or, or others, you also have access to this information through SQL uh, tables. So in this case, we have the all mining models partitions, and you can access this information not only from R, but also directly uh, from SQL. Now, there are other aspects to the models that you might want to, uh, to explore. What were the settings that uh, were used to produce this model? There's the user mining model settings itself that we can create a proxy object for and explore the contents there. There are also other uh, what we call uh, model detail views that allow us to get more insight as to what the in-database algorithm did when it produced this model. And in this case, we have global diagnostics and uh, model quality uh, metrics that are available per partition. So each of those partition models will have its own specific uh, metrics and their corresponding uh, values that you have access to. Now we can also list the model detail views that are available for the in-database model because there are several that are, are there. And this can be done through a select query uh, asking from the user mining model views for the specific model that we have, in this case, the incident forecast uh, one uh, model. And we see those that uh, we could access at this point. The next thing is, since we've built these forecast models, key is we want to see what are those specific forecasts. 
And for this, we're going to be using the specific model detail view uh, to see what those forecasts are. We're going to uh, work on the, uh, the forecast proxy object and perform a mutate from dplyr, getting the date ID, the count, uh, the forecast count and lower upper bound and arrange that sorting uh, by partition and uh, date ID. And so here we're seeing the result from that, but let's look at what the actual forecasts were. So here the count is NA because those are the four periods that we're predicting and the forecast count, the upper and lower bounds. And if we wanted to do a, a quick visualization of the count and forecast count, we see that here. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry, and she's going to highlight how we can do very similar things through OML for R using a third-party IDE, in this case, RStudio, and leveraging the OML for R universal client. Sherry? Okay. So here is um, RStudio server, and I'm going to connect to both my Oracle database and my Oracle autonomous database from here. It's called the universal client and it can connect to either one and you can work from this client. First, I'll load my packages. Um, first, we'll create the Oracle database connection on premises using my RQ user schema. And then Mark showed all of these, these commands run in the notebook and I'm just showing you that they can run from the client as well. So first I'll create a proxy object from the call data to table in my schema. And then using the overloaded ORA dplyr functionality, I'm filtering my incidents by, by category. So I can see I get my category count and the date, the date received for each. And I can build an in-database model from here. I'm first dropping the model if it already exists, passing all of the model settings to a, a list, and then um, using those um, settings to build the model using ORA ODM ESM, the um, object that comes back is mod. And I can look at the partitions. Each partition for this model contains, each partition for this object contains its own model. So for billing issue, we can see that I've got the model call and the model settings. So we can disconnect from our Oracle database and create an autonomous database connection. So the first thing that I'm going to do is set the TNS admin environment variable to the location of my autonomous database wallet on this host. And then I'm going to connect to the database using the database service level high. Sherry, could you explain what a wallet is? Yeah, the wallet is a, it's actually a file on this host, an encrypted file that is holding my um, OML user credentials. And so that's the reason that I don't actually need to pass my credentials in clear text here. I can just um, create the connection string with that corresponds to the autonomous database service level that I want to use, in this case, high. Okay. So then I'm going to create a proxy object for um, the ESM model view result, call that forecasts. And then I'm going to use ORA dplyr to filter the for, uh, to view the forecast for the uh, billing issue category. And those are my results. And this is just to show you that, you know, you don't have to use OML notebooks. You can use a client. Um, in this case, I'm using RStudio. And um, you can connect to Oracle Autonomous Database or Oracle Database on-premises. Um, Sherry, we have another question about uh, if the ORE library is not available on, on CRAN, how do you get access to it? Yeah, and actually, um, you can get it in the Oracle downloads, um, Oracle Machine Learning for R downloads. Um, that will contain the script that you need to use to install OMO for R upon Oracle database and the supporting the third-party supporting packages. For um, earlier versions of the database, the um, the script to actually install it is included with the database as well. So you'd want to look at the installation instructions and make sure that you're following the correct instructions for your Oracle database version. Great. Thanks, Sherry. All right. So let's continue with the uh, churn prediction example. So in this case, we're going to, again, of course, import uh, our libraries and do some data preparation. And in this, we're going to get a proxy object to the table that we're calling customer churn 45K. It has 45,000 uh, rows in it. We're going to enable row indexing by assigning uh, row names and then convert the churner column to a factor. Now, using standard R, we're going to generate the uh, sampling indexes that we want to use, and then 
create the train set and the uh, test set using standard R syntax, passing in the index that we have uh, created earlier. And you can see that the result of this, both of these objects are also proxy objects, ORE frame instances, and the training data has about has 27,000 uh, rows and test 18,000 rows. Now, to highlight that, uh, you know, how does the in database table representation map to the R representation? I did a describe here uh, using SQL because in the notebook environment, you can have paragraphs of all different types in the same notebook. You can have uh, SQL, PL SQL, Python, and R, of course, and Markdown as well. And so here we're describing what this table looks like from the SQL perspective. And we can also describe this from uh, the proxy object using uh, the attribute here. And we see that you know, customer ID is numeric and a churn is a factor because we modified that up above and uh, the remainder of the uh, columns with their respective types. So moving on to modeling, we're going to build a random forest model. And how do we uh, do that? Well, again, as we saw in the previous notebook, we can drop the model that we've created, RF churn model one, and we're going to use ORE ODM RF, passing in the R formula, is churner is our target. We want to take out the customer ID. We're using our proxy object, customer churn 45k.train, and that the model uh, name is going to be RF churn model one. From there, we get the prediction. We're going to invoke the overload uh, predict uh, function, passing in our model proxy object, because that's important to know. When we get finished building the model, it exists in our database schema as a first class database object. And we're actually being returned a proxy object to that in database model. And that's what we're supplying here in predict, along with the proxy object for our database a table result. And the supplemental columns is uh, going to be is churner. Now, this is an important concept as well, because when you have an R object, a data frame, the first row is always the first row. The second row is always the second row. However, when you're dealing with uh, data in a database, the relational model is essentially unordered, right? There is no ordering unless you explicitly ask for that data to be ordered according to some uh, key. And so rather than incur the overhead for that, we rely on this notion of having supplemental columns that we can then associate with the predictions that we get back in that same table. And we'll see a little bit about what that means uh, shortly. But if we look at the proxy object itself, we have the call, of course, and the settings that were used uh, to produce that model. And in some cases, these settings were automatically chosen by the in-database algorithm, because we certainly didn't specify all of those. Now, we can also build support vector machine models, among others, and we're just highlighting two of the available models. So we'll, again, delete that model that we've perhaps built in the past. Using the uh, ODM SVM uh, function, we'll do basically the same thing we did before. One thing you'll notice is that the type is classification, and that's because our SVM algorithm supports both classification and regression. We'll do the predict as before, but one additional item is to do the predict and ask for the top N attributes. And this allows us to return the most influential predictors that help us explain the prediction. So we're gonna get those uh, the top two of those. In the case of the uh, basic prediction result, we have is Turner, the original, uh, the actual target. And then we have the prediction that's being made for that. We have the probability of zero and the probability of one. So what is the positive case for is Turner? Oh yeah, thanks, Sherry. So the, the positive case, of course, is going to be one in this case and the negative case being uh, zero. But if we go further for the ex explanation of why given predictions were being made, we can also uh, see that in this case, the first prediction, which is a negative outcome, that household size played a significant role. Or in the third one, that uh, whether or not they purchased a certain application uh, or didn't purchase it was influential and their education had a, a role in that as well. And we'll look at this in another context uh, shortly. If we wanted to evaluate the results of the model, we have the predictions that were made by the algorithm, and we can use the overloaded uh, table function to compute uh, an in-database cross-tab using proxy objects. 
So again, this computation is occurring in the database without having to, uh, to move that data to, uh, to the client. And here we see the, the resulting confusion matrix. There are other metrics, of course, that we might compute as well, ROC curve, lift chart, probability densities, and these were all produced using uh, R. Deployment. Deployment is one of the key areas for uh, how do we leverage R in uh, enterprise applications. And if you have your data science team that is working from an R perspective, these in-database uh, models can then be used from SQL. So if you're handing these off to perhaps others in your IT environment or your application development team, they can leverage prediction operators that are available in the SQL language for the Oracle database and use the model objects that were created above because these are first class database objects, just like tables. And so we're going to get the prediction and the prediction details, which is going to, again, tell us what are the factors that most contributed to this prediction. So here we see that the first uh, customer here is declared as uh, is Turner, yes. And year's residence with the value of five and this corresponding weight is what most contributed to that uh, prediction. Same thing with this product purchase, uh, that whether or not they did, and if that, uh, the corresponding weight that that has as well. Now we can use this model, uh, not only from SQL and R, but also from REST. And Sherry's going to show us uh, how that works in Postman. Okay, so here is Postman. This is a, a REST client. The first thing that I need to do is to get an authentication token. And I do that by sending a post request to this token endpoint. I have saved my Oracle machine learning user credentials in this environment here in Postman. And that includes the uh, OML URL, which I saved as a variable. And when I send that request, <clears throat> I will exchange my username and password for this access token, which will um, be good for an hour and it can be refreshed before it expires or you can get a new one after it expires. Now, when I deployed this model through the, um, the models interface in OML notebooks, I saved the, the model with a model URI called RF churn model one. And if I want to just take a look at the model deployment details, I send a GET request to this model URI, and I can get you know information about this deployment. I can see that I saved it as a version 1.0, that it's an in-database model, OML, created by a user OML user. There's a model ID associated with it, and all of the model metadata. Now to score a single record, I pass a single record. Here's my record to the scoring endpoint with the model URI. And I'm also, just like Mark did, requesting the top two most influential predictors. So I can see my scoring results, I get back. And then here, household size um, had the most impact on this prediction, followed by Ybox games. Can also score in many batches of records. In this case, I have a, a two records that I'm passing to the scoring endpoint. And when I get my results back, I can see the results for both of those records. Sherry, how many records can we include in a mini batch? You can include up to 256 records in a mini batch. Um, and after that, you would need to use our asynchronous APIs for batch scoring. Okay, and how did we get the model deployed to be able to use it as REST endpoints? Yeah, great question. So you can actually do that here using REST commands. But um, what I did was we have a, a one-click way to do this in, in OML Notebook. So let me log in. And then after I'm logged in, I'm going to go to the models interface. Now this models interface shows us all of the the models that we have access to in, in our database. <clears throat> so I'm going to look up RF churn model one, here it is. And here is how I, I deployed it. The deployments are in here. You can see that it's been deployed. So the way that I did that was I selected the model, hit deploy. I gave it a URI, which is the same as the model name, a version. and a namespace if we'd like, and then whether I wanna share this model with um, other users in my database. And now it, I get a message that the model's been deployed. 
And I can go here and I can look at the model metadata. And I can also see the open API specification for this model. Again, you can also do this through REST endpoints if you want, but this is a simple one-click way to deploy your in-database model to the OML services model repository. Okay, back to you, Mark. All right, thanks, Sherry. Um, so we're gonna continue on the churn prediction, but we're going to look at using a native R model uh, from our part. And so for data preparation for this, we're gonna use a, a data set that has 4,500 rows in it. We're gonna pull that data to the client. And then uh, we're also gonna pull a, a 45K data set to uh, the clients as well. And you'll see how we use those going forward. Now, building the R part model, this should be very familiar if you're uh, familiar with R. We load the R part uh, package, we build the model, and uh, we can look at the, the results uh, from that as well. But for deployment and to be able to use embedded R execution that I mentioned earlier, we're going to go through a few steps. And one is that we're going to save this model in the uh, database R data store. And this, you can store any of your R objects in the database as opposed to having to store them in flat files and manage them uh, separately. So in this case, we have the uh, churn model data store, and we see that that's reflected here. And also, if we look at the contents of the churn model data store, we see the R part mod R, it's the variable name that we had, that it's an R part object, and the corresponding size of that. Okay, so that's part one. Next, to use embedded R execution, we're going to create a user-defined R function that we'll use for scoring. We're going to invoke that user-defined function locally to verify that it behaves as expected. We're going to save that UDF in the database R script repository, so we can actually store our function in the database. And then we're going to invoke that using two different functions. One is the ORE table apply, which will pass in all of the data that we identify in our proxy object to that function. And also row apply, that's going to use data in chunks to that and potentially with multiple R engines that are supporting that. So in this case, we're, we have the score data function that we're creating that takes in a data frame, our first argument, dat, and DS name, which is the name of the data store where our model is stored. We're going to load the data store into memory. So that's going to take our R part model and bring that into our function so that we can use it. Our result is going to consist of a customer ID column and the is churner column because we want to do a cross tab after we get our prediction results, say to do a confusion matrix. And then we get our predictions as well using the R part mod R model, the data that was passed in, which is an actual data frame at this point. And of course, type is, is class. And if we look at the results that come back from this, okay, this is pretty much what we expect. From there, we're going to load our user-defined function into the R script repository. So we're going to give it the name score data, just the same name as we have for our function, but you could use anything that you'd like there. And then we're going to list that from the uh, script repository. And here you see the name, the score data, and the corresponding script. Now, to invoke this, we'll use first ORE table apply. And you'll notice that this is the proxy object, customer churn 4500. So the data exists in the database. The function name is the uh, name of that function that's in the script repository. And the DS name is where our model resides, the R part model. And we call that uh, data store a uh, churn model. Now, what happens when we invoke this is we're uh, starting up an R engine that is going to process this request. It's going to load the data from the database into our memory process that result and return that for us. And here we see that, you know, this is the prediction that we are expecting from that. Now we can do the same thing from ORI row apply. The main difference here, well, one, we're gonna use the 45K proxy object, our score data, the churn model uh, data store, but we're specifying the number of rows that we want to be in each chunk. And so what this is going to end up doing is causing our function to be invoked five times, we've got 4,500 rows, and that we were requesting parallel of two, meaning that you should have two R engines that are supporting this. And so that's how we can get some parallelism out of that. And again, the results coming back from that. 
Can we use the scripts saved in the script repository outside of embedded execution? Yes, absolutely. So it's not only that you uh, can uh, store these uh, scripts, these oh. user-defined functions in the script repository for invocation through the embedded R execution, but you may want to store other functions that are just uh, available that you can conveniently load as opposed to having uh, separate script files that exist uh, elsewhere that you would have to, uh, to manage. Okay, so the next thing is to uh, use embedded R execution from SQL. And when you do that from autonomous database, you need to set an authentication token. Sherry showed how we uh, did that from the REST interface uh, a moment ago. But then once we get that token, we're, we'll be able to use that in subsequent uh, invocations. And this sequence here is going to take advantage of a function get token two. And we've already provided the URL, username, and password in a table because we didn't want to display that in the open text here. And so we'll get back the token and then we're going to set that token so we're ready to, to use that in other functions. And so the next thing is to invoke the RQ row eval two. Now this is the equivalent from the SQL perspective of the ORI row apply function that we showed a moment ago from R. And so you'll notice a few similarities. This is the input data. This is the table name now, customer churn 45K. We have the parameter list, the data store name, churn model, that we want this to be done in parallel. So we're going to set the parallel flag to true. The asynchronous flag is set to true because this is going to be an asynchronous invocation. Some of these operations can take a long time to process. So what you'd like to do is to set up the job, run it, and then uh, check for the, uh, the result being completed. And we're also going to use a service level of high to uh, encourage parallel processing in multiple R engines. The output format will be JSON. The number of rows is again 10,000. That's what we specified from the uh, row apply function earlier. And the name of the function that we're invoking is score data. So after invoking this, we have a job ID. And this job ID is now going to allow us to find, you know, when is this result uh, complete? And what we will get back when it is complete is this URL that we can then uh, process to retrieve the result. And here we see that we're actually we're opening the cursor, we're getting the uh, job result itself, the customer ID is churner and prediction result, and getting the first 10 rows of that. And that's what's coming back from our, our SQL invocation. But we can also do this from REST. And now Sherry's going to take us through that. Okay, thank you, Mark. So here I um, can score my data in asynchronous mode. I'm, here are the parameters that I'm passing to the function. So you can see I'm passing that I want to run this in async mode uh, with a timeout value of 300 seconds. Um, you can actually, this is an optional parameter. You can say, you know, if this runs for over 300 seconds, please you know, time out the number of rows that I want to run at a time through the row apply, the input data, customer churn 45K, the parameters that I'm passing to, to the script itself, the data store name, whether I want this to run in parallel and the service level, mm -hmm. um, the autonomous database service level that I want to use. Yeah. So Sherry, could you contrast the, the low and high service level for us and what are the options that we have available there? Right, so Autonomous Database has um, service levels for parallelism and concurrency. And with um, low, you get the lowest amount of parallelism and concurrency. Medium is a moderate amount, moderate amount of parallelism and concurrency. And then high is the highest level of parallelism and concurrency. So this time I'm, I'm using the service level high. The default is low. We can see that, that we get HTTP status 201 back. That means that my job has been created. A job ID has been generated. And in the background here, I saved that job ID to, to a variable. So I can pull using that job ID, um, which is part of a URL, I can pull the job status. See if it's still running or if I'm actually given a, a, a HTTP status telling me to go fetch the result. And HTTP 302 indicates that my job result has been found so that I can send a GET request to the job URL result and get the return value for my script here. 
and it comes back in a JSON format. And you can see that for this first customer here, customer ID, um, they are not a churner. And down below, you can see all the other customers and what most contributed to those predictions. Sherry, how can we get the curl command that's associated with this REST invocation? Right, so if you wanted to run these in curl, you would go to the code button and, and here's the curl. So you can see we're passing this token, okay, and our headers. And um, this is my OML URL. This is my job ID and I'm pulling the result location. So you can just copy this and paste it into your, you know, your Mac terminal, or your Linux terminal, and run that curl. All right. So with association rules, let's go a bit further. Again, we're going to import our libraries as before. One thing that I'm going to highlight a little bit differently here than we did before is instead of doing a sync from a table or a view, we're going to uh, specify a query. So this is going to get us a proxy object that corresponds to the result of, of this query. So we're going to start with a table uh, sales two and products two are the two tables. From the sales table, we want the customer ID, product ID, quantity sold and amount sold. With the products, we've got the product name and the product category as well. And so so here we've got about 186,000 rows. We've got 72 rows from the products uh, table, and we just see a few uh, rows coming back from uh, from each of those to highlight, you know, what's what content is there. But what we'd like to do is combine these two. So we want to join them, merge them using the overloaded merge function of OML for R, the transparency layer. And so we have product DF and sales DF, and we're going to take the unique uh, rows from that. And we have a result of about 56,000 uh, rows that we'll be working with. Looking at the uh, sales transcust, which is again a proxy object as a result of the join that we just did, uh, we see we have the customer ID, the product name, and the product category. And then the distribution, if we wanted to view that as well, we can use the overloaded table for uh, cross tab and look at the counts of each product category and use standard R for doing the plot result of that. Now, with association rules, one of the settings that we can specify is the rule length. And so we're going to build two models, one with uh, rule length two, one with rule length three. What that means is that in the case of two, we have one element in the antecedent, uh, the if part of the rule, and one in the consequent. And with rule of length three, we've got two in the antecedent and uh, one in the consequent. And so you can increase the, the rule length as you'd like, depending on you know, what type of analysis that you, you want to do. But in this case, we're pr providing to the association rules algorithm in the database the fact that we have a data frame proxy object, the sales a transcust. We identify those special columns, the case ID, which is really the transaction ID, if you will, and also the item uh, ID column, which in this case is product name. We can specify minimum support and confidence, and of course the rule length, and in this case the uh, setting is the name of the model that we want to, to produce. And in each of these cases, you know, we have the corresponding objects that are the model uh, proxy objects, because these are in database uh, models that are produced, and we're able to manipulate them now and use them from R. Um, so let's create a table with candidate bundles from item sets. One of the computed results from the association rules algorithm is the set of item sets. And so accessing this, we're going to uh, order these uh, based on the support and the number of items in decreasing uh, order. And to highlight that, you can not only pull data from the database into our memory, but we can also take data frames from the client and create tables in them. And we can create tables explicitly materialized from other uh, data frame proxy objects. So if we did want to have an explicit table uh, representation of that, we can do that as well. And that's what we're highlighting here with the candidate bundles and creating the table candidate bundles all in caps. And we're showing a few of the results uh, from that. One of the things that you'll notice is this is kind of a transactional representation where we have multiple rows corresponding to the same item set ID. And so these first three rows uh, relate to the uh, single item set that we're seeing here for these items. Now, we might want to have a more convenient way of representing that. Perhaps we'll say that let's have one row per item set with the results. One way of doing that is that we'd like to concatenate these together. Now, just to you know, highlight that 
not all of the dplyr functionality that you'll encounter in R has been replicated in OML for R. So there are cases where you're simply not going to be able to, to do the equivalent functionality. Uh, this is one such example. Here we have the candidate bundles, right? This is a proxy object. The group by and the summarize, if you're familiar with, with dplyr, you might have uh, used something like this, but the paste function in this case is not uh, available for that. So to take advantage of this from R, you could pull the candidate bundles into uh, R memory, and then you'll see the corresponding results here where these are all concatenated as you would expect from R. Um, but alternatively, you might want to use this from SQL. And so if you have members in your team that are leveraging these results, they might be familiar with the list egg function, and they'll produce a similar result here with those uh, results uh, forming the individual item list. If we want to display the top rules that are sorted by confidence and support, here we're just going to pull out the rules themselves, and we'll say, uh, let's get the, uh, the top rules uh, from this. And again, because this is a, a transactional representation, uh, multiple rows will correspond to the individual rules. And we're seeing that. So in this case, we're saying that, you know, baseball is life cap plus the uh, bucket of 24 synthetic baseballs implies purchase of linseed oils. So how can we use these types of rules to make predictions? Well, one of the ways is that we can pull out those rules that have a certain item in the left-hand side. And so here, we'll, let's say if the person has indoor cricket ball in their basket, then what else should we recommend to them? And we're just going to pull out those specific rules for that. And we see that, well, if the left-hand side has indoor cricket ball, we might be uh, interested in uh, recommending to them any of these items that are here on the right. And that concludes the set of uh, three demonstrations. So let's go back and just wrap up our presentation. So uh, this brings us to a summarizing the uh, broader context in which OML for R exists. You'll find SQL and Python interfaces as well. Uh, the SQL API is really the foundation for the in-database algorithms. Uh, OML for Pi has similar functionality to OML for R, but it also includes AutoML, uh, automated machine learning capabilities. And on autonomous database, you've seen OML notebooks. There's also a no-code AutoML user interface where the resulting classification regression models can be immediately used from SQL queries or deployed to OML services for real-time scoring using REST endpoints, as Sherry demonstrated for us. The no-code uh, data and model monitoring UIs support the broader MLOps requirement for tracking changes in data that support applications and models, as well as changes in machine learning model quality. And lastly, the original OML user interface, Oracle Data Miner, which is a SQL developer extension. So in summary, you know, we've seen how uh, you can use R for accessing and manipulating database data. With OML for R, we leverage the database as a high performance computing environment for data exploration, preparation, and machine learning modeling. And with in database machine learning algorithms from an R API, we're gaining scalability and performance in part by eliminating data movement and leveraging algorithms that are designed for parallelism and memory optimizations. We also can easily deploy machine learning models and invoke our user-defined functions with system-provided data parallelism and task parallelism. Now, by operating in the database, users benefit from database backup, recovery, and security, so we don't have to handle these separately in our applications. Further, the OML for R interface is included with your autonomous database instances and Oracle database licenses. So note that on Oracle Database, you do need to explicitly install OML for R. And as we mentioned, uh, from the client perspective, this is supported through the Linux operating system. So if you have your data in or accessible through an Oracle Database, you can readily take advantage of this R-based functionality. So for more information, you know, here are a few resources. You can also try this functionality in your database or on the autonomous database free tier and explore workshops through the Oracle Live Labs. And this will give you guided tours through various aspects of the OML components. So thanks for joining this session. And if there are any more questions, we're happy to take them now.
Yes, feel, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Mark, there was an interesting question at the beginning of the presentation about the difference the differences between the OML notebook interface and Jupyter Notebooks. So uh, with the OML notebooks, this is an environment that actually was developed by Oracle Labs and has a number of separate features that allow for built-in visualizations. It allows you to incorporate and to load uh, both Zeppelin and uh, Jupyter Notebooks and to export not only native representations, but also uh, Zeppelin and Jupyter Notebooks as well. So you can interoperate with those environments. And when you're opening a, a notebook, you can open it in both uh, sort of Zeppelin uh, mode, which allows you to you know, restructure some of the paragraphs and how they're displayed, their widths and whatnot, or you can open it in a Jupyter format as well. And so those are just some of the characteristics that we've incorporated into the, the notebook environment. Yeah, and we also um, you know, provide ready to use interpreters for our Python SQL, PL SQL, and Conda for installing third-party packages. Exactly, yes. You don't have to configure anything uh, to take advantage of those additional uh, languages. That's all provided with the autonomous database notebook environment. And then in terms of running from a Windows client, which was asked a few times, hmm. what I demonstrated here today, I took an OCI Linux compute node, installed OMO for our client there, and then I just exported a few ports so that I could run it directly on my laptop browser. You can reach out to me if you need the instructions to do that. Any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very much for joining us. And until next time.